Well, amen. He mentioned it was a cold morning. I wonder what a cold morning in East Africa is like. <clears throat> yeah, 70 or... Uh, I have a friend, well, a church in uh, Amarillo, Texas, Arden Road. They just went down there, and uh, I think it only gets to like 80. That's like their cold time of the year, and they're like in hoodies and stuff uh, around that time of the year because that's when it's, it's really cooled off. So uh, all about where you live and the perspective you have, right? Well, keep praying for them. And by the way, that so that is a June letter, but that came in yesterday because um, it comes from Africa. So who knows how, I guess, six weeks or something. Brother Luke for that. Well, let's turn to 1 John then back over here and really going to continue kind of a continuation of the message this morning and going to look again at the same passage here, same verses out of 1 John, uh, verse 5. And tonight we're going to look at verses 18 and 19 um, and kind of talk about part two of the confidences that John gives us. And and I'll review a little bit. I'm not going to review a lot because you were here like an hour ago or whatever. And, and heard the message, so I don't feel like I have to review too much, uh, but we'll look at this again. First John 5, let's start in, uh, well, let's just go ahead and start in verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye, ha- and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin, for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Here's our scripture for tonight. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and that we are in him that is true, even in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. All right, we're going to look tonight at verse, uh, really verse 18 and 19, but just look back up to verse 13. This is the key verse in the, in the whole book of 1 John, and, and the reason that uh, I've entitled the whole sermon series, That You May Know. I, I count seven, maybe eight times, I can't remember, uh, but I, seven or eight times in those last few verses, he uses the word, and we know, and we know, and we know, and we know. And he's trying to instill some confidence in these believers, who who he calls little children throughout the whole book. So maybe they're younger believers, maybe they're believers that have been around for a while, but to John, probably somewhere around 90 years old, they're all little children to him at that point. And uh, he's trying to instill some confidence in them. And so this morning we looked at the confidence that comes through our prayer life. And it can't be understated, sorry, it can't be overstated rather, uh, how important our prayer life is. Not just that we would uh, be able to ask uh, which, by the way, Shermans, you're going to have to pick a pew and stay there. All right, last week you're over here. This morning you're over there. Now, I, this is really confusing to me. All right, no. <laughs> just, no, keep me on my toes. Y'all just keep moving. Y'all just keep moving around. Y'all don't know what happens inside this skull of mine. Um, I'm just trying to keep focused at all times. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe you do. <laughs> All right. No, not just so we get our prayers answered. That's a great thing when you have a need and, 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 and you can, you know, we have someone we can go to. We can go into the throne room of God with, with boldness, Hebrews says, and we can ask for our needs to be met and God meets our needs. So it's important in that way. It's important that we can also pray for one another and lift one another up. By the way, we could go back to the first couple of verses here in the chapter or really several places in First John and see that Praying for one another is, is, an, uh, is evidence that we love one another. And if we love one another, we know that we are of God. That's another evidence that he's given us. So all these things are intertwined and connected. And it is good that we can pray for one another. But, but just having that open communication with God and seeing him work on our behalf and hearing Him uh, his, his voice and 
hearing him through the word of God and his spirit lead us, it gives you an assurance. And, and so the, I tried to make the connection and uh, that, that marriage is very much the same way. If your communication is good, um, th then you're going to have very a lot of confidence in your marriage and in your relationship. But if your communication is not good, you won't. It's really the same thing here. Now, tonight we're going to look at the second part, which we find in verse 18 and 19, which deal with, uh, I'm just calling it the sanctified life. We don't find the word sanctified here in the text, but John is describing exactly what it means to be sanctified and what the Bible uh, identifies as being sanctified. So to be sanctified means to be set apart. The, uh, the Bible uses the word holy. It uses the word peculiar. Uh, and the word holy and peculiar just mean literally other than. Uh, so different than the world. So if we're going to be um, holy, it means that we're going to be different than the world. We're going to be other than. Uh, we're going to be peculiar. Uh, we, could, we could call it strange, right? In short, though, it just means we're going to be different from the world. And as John is saying, here's another evidence. Here's something that you can look at, and, and it should help you in your confidence. As, as you look around, you, you say, okay, yes, my life stands in contrast to the world. Maybe one of the best places to see uh, what it means to be set apart or the maybe the importance of holiness is over in 2 Corinthians. So meet me in 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. If you have your Bible, just turn back there and, and let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 uh, together real quick. <clears throat> just a good passage on what it means to be holy, what it means to be set apart, um, different than the world. And, and by the way, just as a side note while you're turning, the worse the world gets, the easier it should be for us to be different. I mean, really, the further off the cliff they go, uh, the more we should look strange to them, right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, we often use this passage as, it, when we talk about marriage, and we, we would say to a saved person, it's, it's not a good idea for you to marry an unsaved person. I think it's pretty obvious uh, that that it would be a bad idea uh, and that that's not going to work out very well. But this passage here is, is not just talking about the context of marriage, but also just being yoked up, being hooked up, connected up with the world and people of the world. It's, it's not to say, uh, by the way, that we can't befriend someone of the world or that we can't have an acquaintance that we're, we're witnessing to. We obviously are to be friendly. That being yoked up, you, you know what a yoke is, right? It's like you got the two oxen and you put the thing around their head, that's the yoke, and, and it keeps them together. So it's like, it's this idea of fellowshipping and working together with them. Well, we have to stay separate from the world. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? Uh, you know, light and dark, you can't mix them. You ever thought about that? They, they, they can't mix. It's either light or it's dark. Uh, when light shows up, darkness flees. And so he's saying, just like this, you can't be un unequally yoked with unbelievers. You're not going to have fellowship. It's like trying to mix light and dark. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, here, here's the idea of being holy. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So it's clear from Scripture that the Christian, and the church for that matter, should not look the same as the lost world. When we look at our lives, and we take, a, uh, take stock of our lives, our families, uh, etc., we should, we should look different than the world. In fact, like I said, the closer we get to Christ, the more different we should look. The further that they get from Christ, the more different uh, we should look. But if we look at our lives and, and we look at how we live and, and then we look at the, the lost people around us and it's pretty much the same, there's a problem, right? Because we're supposed to be different. Um, we're we're going we're gonna to talk different, walk different, act different. You know, all of those things, they're going to be different. Um, I, I didn't read this book. I just saw an ex excerpt from the book uh, years ago and I don't even remember... Uh, the title of the book. I think I do, but I'm not going to say it in case it was a different book and I don't want to uh, misrepresent a book. But I was reading a book and it was about uh, how, to, how to grow a church. <clears throat> and, um, and I wasn't reading the book. I saw an excerpt from the book about how to grow a church. I, I misspoke there. Um, I already have a book about how to grow a church, so I don't really need any of those. But 
that's just a little the smart aleck me coming out a little bit. But um, no, I was re- there's an excerpt there, and in, in what it was is it being used as a sermon illustration because this book said, you know, if you want to grow a church in America today, what you need to do is go into the community and you need to take a survey of the community. You need to see who's there, <clears throat> what their preferences are, what they like. Ask them some questions. What do you want in a church? Uh, what, what kind of music do you enjoy? And, and what kind of services do you like? How do you want the, the stage to look? And, and you know, what, what's important to you, uh, the community? And then you go in, and I'm telling you, this is a, this is a well-known writer, uh, has influenced thousands of churches. And he, go, he said, that, then you take that, and that's what you do. You go do whatever they say to do. Um, here, here's the only issue with that. It, when we come to God in church, who are we here to, to please? Who are we here to worship? You know, if, if we come in and it's like, well, I like this music, so I want this music only. A lot of people choose churches these days based just solely upon the music. You know, they don't even listen to the sermons. They're just like, I like this sort of music. If you don't have it, then I'm out of here. Well, who are we worshiping there? If we're just, if it's just like, oh, you like this music, well, I, I don't know that... I don't know that we care if you like the music. You know what we do care? We care if he likes the music because it, it, the music is here to worship him. The style of services that we have and the, and the way we conduct ourselves, it, it can't come from worldly opinion from the neighborhood. And, and what do you want? Uh, you know, this isn't a rec center, right? This is a church. And we have very strong uh, commandments and convictions about what a church should be. And if we build the church properly, what we're going to find out is that it is much, much different than anything the world offers. And so if we offer something here, by the way, um, we don't, when I say offer, okay, we're not supposed to come to church for what we get, right? That's not, that's not the purpose. We come together to grow in the Lord, but really the idea is to equip our, ourselves to serve, right? Uh, so, so when we say what we offer, I mean this, what we offer to him. Okay, so if we come together and and what we offer him looks like the same thing that the 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 secular world offers, then we're doing something wrong. But so many churches today have gotten to the point where they they're they're truly just mimicking the success that the world has had. And and we've got to stay away from that because that's that's not our it's not our job to do. Um, Again, yes, you can fill up a building that way. I mean, it's pretty easy. You can fill up a building that way. And if, if, if that is our interest, is just filling up a building, then, then sure, I, I guess that's probably what we should do. But listen, our interest, now, now don't get me wrong. As a preacher, I, I've walked these pews and touched them and prayed that God will fill every one of them. I do it pretty often. I, I want to see the, the people come to Christ. I want to see the church grow, but I'm not just here to fill up a building. I, I want to see people's lives change, people saved, people being discipled. I want to see this. I want to see people getting less and less like the world. Um, if you go into a place and, and, and you figure out what they want, and then you come and you give them that, listen, you have not won them. They have won you. It's just the fact of the matter. And, and there's fewer and fewer churches, by the way, that really stick to God's plan and... and uh, but, it, but it's not just about the church either. It's, it's about individuals. It's about our, our family life and our family culture. It's about the, the way that we behave ourselves personally at the job or wherever it might be. We are supposed to be different. And that's what he's saying in verse, uh, well, I'm over here in 2 Corinthians still, in verse 18 and, and 19, that's what he's saying. If, if, if we're bo- born of God, we're going to be different. Look at verse 19. We know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. There's a, there's a, there should be a giant contrast between the life of a believer and the life of an unbeliever. There just should be. Um, I, I just don't believe the, the, that a believer ought to be watching the same movies that an unbeliever is going to watch. I just don't believe that they should. Um, there, there's been a couple of, of series, you know, that come out. I'm like, I'll get all excited, like a historical series or something. And I watch three minutes of it and I'm like, well, we're turning this off. Like, I'm not listening to this. Why? Because I, I'm not going to sit there and fight the Holy Spirit for an hour uh, when he's telling me to turn it off and, and that I shouldn't be hearing all this garbage. Like, no, it's just going to get turned off. We, we can't have the same media anymore. We can't have the same music. We can't have the same uh, lifestyle in general as the world. We're going to be different. And so um, that's what John's saying. And so if we come to a place in our Christian walk that our life looks very much like the world, you're not going to have much confidence. 
And why won't you have confidence? Well, because you're going to look around and you're going to say, well, I look just like you know, Fred at work who's an atheist. We look, we look about the same. There's really no difference. Um, and so the, another confidence builder here, another thing that John is pointing out that gives us assurance is that God changes us. And the things that we, were, we used to... Have you ever put a movie in? And, and I, I know I'm not here to get on movies, but have you ever put a movie in that you watched years ago and you thought, oh, this is a good one. Let's watch this. It was funny or whatever, you know, and you put it in and then all of a sudden you just turn bright red because you're like, what, why did I watch this? Why did I think this was good? I don't remember all this bad stuff in here. You know what that, you know what's happened? The movie was the same VHS you put in 20 years ago. Anyone remember VHS? Okay, yeah, it's the same one. You know what happened? You grew. You grew, and so your standards grew, and 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 what you what the what you, now your your uh, your uh, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit increased, and and now something that used to not bother you really does bother you. That's called growth, and that's a good thing. So he gives us four things here, I think that uh, that that maybe explain this very well. The first one is this: we understand if we're saved, we've received a new nature. Look at verse eighteen. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. All right, so John covered this topic earlier in this very letter, but here he offers it again as a first step to understanding what it means to have a life that is opposite by the, by the world, than the world. So uh, what he's not saying is probably a good place to, to start. He's not saying this. He's not saying, listen, if you're saved, you'll never sin. He's not saying that. How do I know he's not saying that? Well, because uh, there hasn't ever been a person who got saved and then ceased from sin. That, that hasn't happened yet. So he can't be saying that. He's not saying that. Notice he says, if you're born of God, he uses those words. And he, he's used those words quite a few times in the letter. And it's one of the themes here of the book. But being born again, of course, we, we talked about it again this, this morning. When Christ saves you, you are born again. You receive a new nature. The Holy Spirit takes your spiritually dead self and he makes you a new creature, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The, 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 the words new creature, it's the same, the same sort of idea as when God spoke the, the heavens and the earth into existence, right? He's not taking and using the old parts. No, he's making you something you never have been. You are a new creature with new foundation. And, and that new nature cannot sin. Let me be clear. The Holy Spirit of God that comes in your life, He cannot sin. He can't. Those that are born of God, that which is born of God, the new nature cannot sin. Um, so turn with me to Galatians 5. I'm going to show you a couple things. Well, if the new nature doesn't sin, what's my problem, right? Um, you don't always listen to the new nature. You still have the old man, right? He's dead. Uh, I die daily is what Paul said. We're supposed to crucify uh, the flesh, right? We're supposed to crucify the old man and get rid of him. But apparently, every now and then, we let him raise his ugly head and, and, and tell us what to do. Because there's once we're saved, there's a new nature. So now there's sort of like, uh, you know, you've got like dual, it's not really the right way to say it, but like dual personalities. It's not the right way to say it. You've got two natures. And they're both fighting for control. You got the flesh. I can't get rid of the flesh until I meet him. When I meet him, he's going to get rid of the flesh. I'll have a new body. The new body is not just about me not dying, although that would be nice, right? But it's not about just that. It's about, uh, no, this old flesh won't want to sin anymore because it won't be an old flesh. It'll be new flesh. So he's, he's going to give me a new body, but until I meet him in the resurrection, I'm sort of stuck with what I got, which is a sinful old flesh. So I have the old flesh, but, I, but then I have the new man. I have the new creation, the new creature. And, and it's like this. The old man, he can't not sin. That's all he can do. That's all he's good for. He, he's, he's always dragging you the wrong way. But the new nature, he can't sin. And so the idea is this. Well, which one am I going to yield to? Okay, so Galatians 5 explains this. Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit. See, that's a command. Walk in the Spirit. He, he didn't say, if you're saved, you'll always be in the Spirit. And you'll never sin. He says, no, here's what you need to remember, Christian. Walk in the Spirit. You, you have an option to do otherwise. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there's a, there's a choice right there, right? There's a choice. I can either walk in the lust of the flesh, or I can walk in the, the Spirit. And here's the problem. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. 
These are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. I know you've had that battle inwardly. You've had that. I've had that. Where, where maybe there's a temptation to do wrong, and inside you, the flesh is like, that's eh, no big deal. Go ahead. I mean, this, you know, honestly, it, you like this thing after all. And then the spirit in you is like, uh, no, no, you shouldn't touch that. Touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them, be separate. Get away from this thing. Don't do this. And there's, there's that pull of conviction over here saying, no, no, don't, don't do that. That's ungodly. You shouldn't do that. It's wicked. And then there's that, that flesh that's saying, no, it'll be fine. The question is, well, which are you going to yield to? There is a battle. Um, thankfully, the more you grow in the Lord, the more victory you have in certain areas. And, and the, the better equipped you are to overcome. And, and, and you kind of get used to saying no to the flesh. And it's easier to walk in the spirit. Um, but he's identifying here in Galatians that, no, we have a, this is an issue that we all have as, as Christians. And he says, now, uh, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So here's what the flesh can get you. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envy, murderings, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Any of that sound fun? And that's what you get from the flesh. That, that's what it wants you to do. That's the direction that it's pulling. We could say this. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit in a second, but that's the fruit of the flesh. All right? So John's like, uh, you need to understand, you got a new nature in you that cannot sin, and, and that's a great evidence uh, that, that for the first time ever, you have a choice to walk away from sin and follow the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, this is a new thing in your life. You're saved now. You don't have to obey the flesh. You can do something better. You can obey the Spirit. Then he goes on to say, uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And look at what he says here. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. He, he's talking about putting away the old man and choosing the spirit. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. You know what he's saying? If we've been saved and we live in the spirit, we've been made alive, we've been born again, we've been uh, saved by the spirit of God. If we live in the spirit, then let us walk of the spirit. But it's a choice. So we have these two natures, and, and, um, and John is saying, you know, one of the evidences in your life for, for the, the fact that you know that you know that you're saved is you're your, your two-natured. The, you, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, and then you have that old flesh. Now, the second thing he says is that we need to understand that it is a choice how we will walk. Verse number 18 says, Whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. He keepeth himself. He that is begotten of God or born again keepeth himself. He uses this word keepeth. And the word keepeth means to attend uh, carefully to, to guard or to take care of. Now, just as a great example, go to, uh, back to uh, Genesis. The, the word keep, we just want to work on the word keep for a second. Genesis 2, if you, if you notice um, in Genesis 2 is when God gives Adam a job. And uh, he puts him in the garden, Genesis 2, and, and look in verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So we know that Adam had a job in the garden. His job was to dress the garden, uh, which was to attend and to work in, to, you know, you could imagine him pruning it and, and, and keeping care of the garden. Uh, but also it, it says that he was to keep it. And the word there, keep, is uh, similar, it's a, it's a Hebrew word, so it's a little bit different, but it's a similar word to that word uh, in 1 John 5.18 that says, he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. It's this word. It means to watch carefully and carefully protect. Now, when Adam failed uh, to protect the garden, right, and he, was, and he ate, ate of the, the fruit he was not supposed to eat of, the Lord then had to step in, you remember, and protect the garden. Uh, Adam didn't keep it. And so now Adam is um, banished from the garden. They're removed from the garden. And it says down, and if you go to chapter number three and look down in verse 24, it says, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Notice it says there that, that God put these cherubims there on the east of the garden. So he drives out the man. And they're no longer allowed in. 
And so how are they going to keep, now how are they going to protect the garden? Well, he puts cherubims there to keep it. The word keep, same word, to watchfully protect. And he says that they have a sword which turneth every way. You know what that means? That means there was no way man was sneaking back into that garden. Uh, You know, um, I'd like to see you try to dodge an angel, a cherubim, with a sword that turneth every way, right? You're not going around them. You're not going under them. You're not sneaking past them. They are watching and they're watchful and the sword turns every, any way you go, their sword turns that way too. And, And you're not getting into that garden. It reminds me that word. So this is the word. This is what I'm trying to say. It was it was Adam's job to keep the garden that way. He should have been he should have been guarding the area and, and, and guarding his wife and, and and guarding everything that was going on. He didn't. And so then God pulls Adam out and he puts a cherubim there to keep to to guard to watchfully protect every every direction of the Garden of Eden. Now this word is so interesting because. The, the Bible says in 1 John 5, 18, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. He watchfully protects on every side. It's like when Paul says in Ephesians 5, see then that you walk circumspectly, circumspectly, not as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. That word circumspectly there, it's similar to this word keep, but it, but it, but it has to do with, um, the, the, we hear the word circumference in there. Any kids excited for school? My kids, I got two of them in here, three, seven, no, nobody's excited for school. Uh, okay, back to math. You're going to learn what a circumference is. It's a circle. Circumspect means I'm going to look 360 degrees around me, and I'm going to keep an eye out for anything that could come in, and I'm going to walk circumspectly, meaning that I'm not going to allow anything into my life that shouldn't be there. So what John is getting at here is he's saying you, you need to um, you need to walk circumspect. You need to make sure you're keeping yourself, just like a cherubim would keep, make sure nothing uh, unclean is coming into that garden. You need to make sure that nothing unclean is coming into your life. We have the Word of God as our map and our measure. We have the Holy Spirit as our compass. But we're to walk every day keeping ourselves. We should have a guarded walk. We should defend against anything that opposes God's Word. When I was a kid... Uh, I remember when Nintendo came out, and uh, man, it was the best thing. Well, actually, it's kind of the worst thing, because it's led, you know, whatever. We won't get into all that. But anyway, oh, I remember Nintendo. But before Nintendo was Atari. Anybody remember Atari? And so with Atari, you had this cool game called Asteroids. And it's still maybe one of the best games that's ever come out. But Asteroids, you remember, it's just this little bitty triangle ship, and you're in the middle of the screen. And I mean, there's rocks flying in from every direction. And what are you doing? <laughs> You know, you're shooting them with the little... No one played Asteroids? Okay. Oh, man. Oh, anyway. Um, no, <laughs> any, any danger that comes from any direction, you're turning and you're taking care of it. That's the idea of circumspect. Is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk and I'm going to have eyes in the back of my head, right? I'm going to make sure that as I'm walking, that I'm not letting anything come in that's unclean. So John's like, there's, there's a bit of a progression here in the text. He's like, there's two natures, right? You, you've got the old flesh. You've got to watch out for him. And you've got the new nature, which can't sin. So that, that's a good thing. But now as you walk, you've got to be very careful not to let anything come in uh, worldly or unclean. You've got, you got to protect every direction. Um, the new nature is there. And so it's possible to live right. But now you have to decide. Keeping yourself is deciding to yield to the new nature and fending off the flesh. And so that's a decision we have to make. There, there's, I, I, I suppose there's groups of people that think once they're saved, they just they live any old way they want to because they're saved and they'll just end up in heaven one day and everything's fine. I, I think if that's your attitude, you may need to back up to see when you got saved and make sure you really did. Because when Christ regenerates you, uh, you get a new nature that doesn't want to sin anymore. And there's going to be a, a, a turmoil inside. And so really what we have to do is, is teach ourselves uh, to keep ourselves. Thirdly, John points out this. We have divine protection from the wicked one. Notice in verse number 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. All right, there's two natures. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. There's our choice to follow the Lord. And, and here's the result. And that wicked one toucheth him not. The wicked one touches him not. Now, Again, I, this is how I like to understand. This is how I understand Scripture. It's, it's, okay, if I don't know what he's saying, let me look at what he's not saying. Okay, sometimes that's kind of how I approach it. 
Um, he's not saying that a Christian will never be tempted. All right? How do I know that? Jesus was tempted. Okay? If Jesus is tempted, I assure you, you will be. Right? Uh, in fact, um, Hebrews 4.15 tells us, We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Okay? With, yet without sin. So Christ was tempted, but without sin. But, he, but he, he does mention in Hebrews 4.15, but you will also be tempted. You're going to be tempted. So when he says the devil doesn't, won't be able to touch you, the wicked one won't touch toucheth you not, it doesn't mean you'll never be tempted to sin. If you examine the Lord's temptation, which is a good thing to do, some tell you go back to read Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11, you need to understand a couple of things. First of all, the, the temptation was allowed by the Holy Spirit. If you go back and look, it says the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness where he's tempted of the devil 40 days. And so the Spirit was in control of the whole thing, but allowed some temptation. Uh, not only that, then we find that the Lord used God's word to fight against the temptation. Verses 4, 7, and 10, all three times the, the word spoke the word and fought the temptation off with the, the scripture. What happened then is in verse 11, it says, then the devil leaveth him. This is a, this is a truth that Jesus uh, lived out where he, uh, he resisted temptation and the devil fled from him. That's what James tells us. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So it's not that you won't be tempted, but he won't be able to touch you. And this is what that word means. If you go look up the word toucheth, it means this, to fasten oneself to, to adhere to, or cling to. In other words, the devil may tempt, but he cannot grasp hold of a Christian who's walking in the Spirit. He, he will flee. James tells us he will flee when we resist. Now, I always thought for years, and I think I've said it here, but I, I, I try to say some of the same things because they've been helpful to me. But for years, I thought to resist mean that I just have to hold out on this temptation until it's over. Right? Resist. Just resist. Don't do it. Just don't do it. But the word resist means to fight, to fight back. If, 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 uh, if there was a resistance in our country, you would say that's a fighting force that's trying to take over. To resist means to fight back. Well, how do we resist? Well, when we're tempted of the devil, we pull out our sword, uh, right? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus quoted scripture. We pull out our sword and we fight back. And if we fight back using the scripture because we have been circumspect, we've been watching and he brings something in our life. We say, oh, no, not this time, devil. I have a sword that turns every way. He'll flee. You see, so these are these are just steps in our Christian walk here that John's giving. We know that we have two natures. We have a choice to yield to the, the, the good nature. And then, so we, we, it's kind of like this. We have a, we, we're born of God, two natures, but then we have a defensive walk, right? I'm, I'm defensive. I'm, I'm watching out for things. But then I have an offensive walk. I have the word of God that I can pull out and I can use to resist, to fight the devil. And the Bible tells me he has to flee. When you're living that sort of life, can I tell you, you're going to have confidence about your salvation because the world can't do any of those things. They don't have two natures. They just have one. The old flesh, that's all they got. Do you remember back before you were saved? And So I got saved when I was eight, all right? So I, I, I didn't commit any mass murders or rob any liquor stores or anything like that But before I was saved. Like it, and I, I, I'm kind of joking, but you know what I mean? When you're saved young like that, sometimes you start thinking, well, I don't really have a testimony of big change. But I always think this, what would I have been doing had God not saved me? Like, what, where would I be today? Probably in the gutter somewhere, right? Um, because I, obviously, no better than any other person who's ever lived on the face of the earth, just as prone to sin and debauchery as any other person on the earth. So I, I'm always thankful for what God saved me from. But I, I just wonder if, if you can remember back to a time when all you had was the old nature and there was no Holy Spirit in you telling you to do good. And, and, and now you've got those two natures. I mean, what a comfort to know no, you have a new create. You are a new creation, and, and you have a new. Uh, you could say there's a new sheriff in town, right? There's someone else you can listen to, and, and then you start to obey him, and you start to make some of those right steps. And, and I'm just telling you, what comes from that is assurance. And then some temptation comes in, and for the first time ever, you resist, and he flees, and you overcome the temptation. I'm telling you, it brings assurance. God help me overcome that. And and the the result of that is what I'll call number four is the assurance that comes from a sanctified life, verse 19. 
And we know that we are of God. We know that. How do we know that? Because we're different. The world lieth in wickedness. And the differences will be and should be obvious. We'll know we've been made different from the world. Someone who doesn't feel safe. You hear that a lot. I just don't feel safe. Very often I find they're not living, they're living more like the world than they are a believer. And so you're not going to feel safe because, well, you're not acting safe. And you know the old saying, you've heard it, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, and well, it's really hard to convince you that it's a goose, right? And so if we're not, if we're not feeling saved, if we're not, but if we're not acting godly, if we're not uh, circumspect in our walk, if we're not guarded, if we're not offensive against sin, um, if we're not yielding to the new nature, I mean, it's going to be hard to feel safe. You should be able to look in your life and see a difference between you and the world. That's the plain and simple truth. You should be able to look in your life and see a difference between the 2024 you and the 2015 you. You should be able to look and see. Oh no, I've grown. God, no, He will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the promise. He's going to help you to grow. If you look back in your life and you don't see any growth, there's a problem. God's changed us along the way. Um, several years ago, some of you have commented about my ugly trailer out here. It's uh, John Deere green with yellow stripes down the side. And if you don't like John Deere, you know what? Get over it. I don't either. But I'm going to tell you a story. All right. Um, a few years ago, uh, my, that trailer was stolen. I had it parked out in front of the uh, or behind the church where I was pastoring just didn't have any room on our property, so I parked it out back at the church there. And, oh, it had been there for a few weeks. Um, but all of a sudden, I needed my trailer. And so I'd run up to the church to get my trailer and look around. It's not there. And I get to thinking, when was the last time I saw this trailer? It, I think it's been gone a while now that I think about it. And sure enough, the, the trailer lock I had bought uh, looked like one uh, whack with a hammer, and that thing was down on the ground. So they, they didn't care about that. They took the trailer. And, you know, I was bummed out, but at the same time, I, I just was like, well, this is where we live. This is the world we live in. It's like, I, I'll just have to, you know, d borrow a trailer or do something else. And, but yeah, my trailer was gone. Now that trailer, it was, it was painted red and it was a really nice, it was a really nice trailer. I had it for many years um, and used it in business and everything. And so I was a little bit bummed out. Well, a couple of weeks later, um, I filed a report and the whole thing showed the police officer the lock broken on the ground and said, I promise you, there used to be a trailer sitting here that was mine, you know. And uh, so anyway, long story short, a couple weeks later, I get a call from the, uh, the deacon. We had one deacon in our church there. And uh, I get a call from him. He, he was the t a county tax assessor at the time. And so he said, I was at work today and uh, the sheriff came in and was showing off pictures of this trailer that he uh, found. Then he knew it was stolen. Um, now, just I don't know how all this works. I filed a report with the city police department. Okay, this is a sheriff, which is not city. So he didn't know that I had filed a report, that kind of thing. I guess they don't talk. I don't, I don't know. Lon, you can help me out later with all that. Uh, anyway, he didn't know it was stolen, but he drove up to this house where they were known to steal things. And they're all out there working like crazy on this trailer. And he just said, this doesn't look right. He pulled up and he said, whose trailer is that? Oh, that's my uncle's trailer. They, he left it here. We don't want anything to do with it. They all went in the house. And so he's like, this is a stolen trailer. And, and so he just uh, took the trailer and, and took it with him because he just knew it was stolen. He, I guess he knew the family, whatever. So he puts it in the little pin. They put all the stolen stuff in. And he's just up at the tax office showing Roland on his phone like, oh, look at this trailer I confiscated today. And Roland takes one look at that trailer and says, I know whose that is. Now, it wasn't red. They had painted it black. And, and uh, they had taken off my 12,000-pound uh, winch. I still don't know where that is. And my spare tire and all that. I'd cry about it a little bit if, if you let me, but we, we'll just move on. Anyway, they had spray-painted the thing black, and they put this little stripe down the side. Um, and, and, and why did they paint it black? You know why? Because every trailer that you see anywhere is black. And it's a really easy way to just for that thing to just go all around town being stolen and no one ever think a thing about it because it's just another black trailer. They painted it black. Well, Roland says, I know whose that is. And 
Thankfully, uh, even though they had repainted it, I, you had to see my trailer, but I had made some modifications to it. Roland knew about it, so he's like, no, that's my pastor's trailer. So they call me, I go, and I'm thinking that trailer must be in Mexico by now. You know, that, that's what happens. They steal it, and they just go straight over the border. And, um, but anyway, there it was in all its glory. You know, no lights, a couple of wheels missing, you know, whatever, but it's there. And I look at it, and I was like, yeah, that's my trailer. It don't look like it did when, I, when it left, but it's mine. I got it back and start fixing it. I put all the lights back on it. And I'm just, I'm praising the Lord. Hey, I got my trailer back, you know, small thing. But hey, uh, I think it's kind of part of me. I've been, we've been together for a while. So I'm putting the lights on it. I'm fixing it. I'm putting the tires, getting everything back, you know, kind of situated. And I think, well, I'm going to paint it because I don't want it to be black. Like, like they did a real bad paint job. They should have, you know, if you're going to paint it, do it right. Is all I'm saying. Um, but they did a real bad like spray paint job. So I'm, I'm like, I'll just go up to the tractor supply and I'll find me some paint. And as I'm walking the aisle, I come by a paint, uh, uh, a can of John Deere green. And then there's a, there's a can of yellow. And I go, yep, that's what I'm doing. Cause I'll have the only green and yellow trailer in town. And it has been the case. I'm telling you, even since I moved here, people are like, what a kind of, is that a John Deere trailer? What is, what's, what is going on with that trailer? You say, why are you telling me this story? When it was painted black, it just melted in with all the other ones. But I, I guarantee you this, I know which trailer, you can steal it today, I'll see you all over town with it. You won't get anywhere, because it, it's different than any trailer that's here. And, and um, that's why I painted it that color. I know it looks ridiculous. I don't own anything John Deere. I don't even care about John Deere. I'm just telling you, that trailer is mine, and I can see it from a long ways off. That's what John's telling us here. He's like, no, you're not going to look like the world anymore. I'm painting you a different color. And I'm going to know you from a long ways off. And it ought to be a comfort in your heart when you look in your life. I mean, I know it's hard to be different than the world. I know it's hard to swim upstream and, and all those things. But, but you, ought to be able to, you ought to be able to rejoice that when you look into your life, it looks different than theirs. That's all he's saying. It's a great confidence. I hear, you know, stories of, just, just homes that are just broken and busted up because of sin and bad decisions and not following the Holy Spirit. And, and then I look at my family, and I'm telling you right now, it is nothing at all that I am or I've done. God just has been the best. I think, what a wonderful home He's given me. Can I tell you, that's different than what the world's got. It's just different. It ought to be a great confidence to you. When you look and you're not, God's given you some victory over sin. And I'm not, no one's perfect. No, no one's re reached a, a level of perfection yet or anything like that. But when you look in your life and you're like, you know what? I, I can actually say I'm just, not, I'm just not given to a life of sin. God's delivered me from that. That's not the same as the world. Praise the Lord. I ought to give you confidence. And so, John, so we've looked at the first two. and We're going to stop here. But the first two is this. Number one, we have a prayer life that consistently confirms that we are His. And then we see God changing us year, week to week, month to month, year to year. We, we see Him changing us and making us more and more like Him and less and less like the world. And boy, that ought to give you confidence. And so praise the Lord when He's changing. If you're, if you're, if you're, Looking around and you're like, man, I'm just like the world. It doesn't seem like I'm changing. I would just encourage you, go back and revisit that day you got saved. Make sure you're in Christ because I'm telling you, He changes you. He, yeah, He'll save you any way that you are. Like, He'll do that, but He will change you. He will urge you to change. And so, how's your confidence? Does your life resemble the sanctified life? Can you see God's work? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us. Lord, and all the blessings of it. Pray that you'd bless us as even we go out now. We've got a lot of day left here. Pray that we'd be a witness if we go out. And uh, Lord, that you'd use us this week, however you so choose. And uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you. Really, Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. Lord, I, looking around at the things that you've given to, to me, and just the life that you've given to me, Lord, I'm just so grateful. And uh, Father, looking back at where I have been, what I have been, and Lord, not, not knowing that I'm not perfect, but just seeing your changing hand, it's such a confidence 
I'm thankful for it. Lord, I pray you, uh, Lord, just be with us as we go out. Help us to have a great rest of our day. I pray for all those in our church that are just kind of finishing up their summer travels and a lot of things going on right now. We just pray that you'd be with everyone. and uh, Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.